Hello. Hello. <laughs> Very good. How are you going? Oh, wait, man? I can record too. No, I can't. Uh, Please not. Ah, fuck it. Anyway. anyway. Same shit. What's going on? Um, I've got a beer. What have you got? I've got a, a sponsorship. Oh, what did you get? I'll show you. It's from a brewery you, you might have heard of called Helios. Oh, look at that. And it's from one of the it's from one of the Adam Shells. Actually, I got a nice note with it as well, which was nice. What did it say? From Adam, Scott, and Charlie or something. Yeah. I should remember it, but it was nice. Anyway, it, I, I literally just found this on my desk. This is how this happens. It's pretty cool. How did it get there? I, don't, I have no idea. It just get, it, It's on my desk in my office at BH2 with a little note. It's amazing. Let's see, what, let's see how this thing goes. Are you familiar with this beer? It's a uh, specialty saison. Oh, I, I believe I've had that one. It's packed on the 16th of March, 2022, so it's fresh as shit. That would have been last week when I had it on the show last week. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. I've got a, a big glass here that's reasonably clean. I haven't used this one for about a year, so hopefully. Mate, that's that's not a Saison glass. I'm sure just going to say right now. No, but it can handle a lot of head, so I was expect, expecting this to be a bit bubbly. Look at that. It's looking amazing. Pretty that good. That is a, uh, that looks like a wheat beer glass, dude. Yeah. All right. You know what you need? Mm. You need a boot, a glass boot to drink out of. Why do I need that? I don't know. Just if you're going to be it in smells Germany. A bit, it smells a bit um, banana-y sort of wheat beer-like. Well, they're very closely related, but not quite. The yeast is... Actually, I'd probably say the the malt would be very similar to a Hefeweizen um, in that there's quite a bit of wheat mm. in there. But it, um, it tastes more like a Hefeweizen than a Saison, I think. The yeast, the yeast would be different. There's There'd be a little yeah. bit of banana ester going on there. There'd be a little mm. like a bit of sort of peppery sort of phenolic kind of thing going on as well. What's, um, I should, I should read this. What's, um, Ipswich Brewers Union? That's, you know the, that IB, that's the IBU. That's the, the Ipswich Brewers Union. That's the homebrew club that they collabed with to do that. There you go. Another shout out for the show. Yeah, that's bloody oh, great. It's really Thank good, isn't you. It? Thank you, Adam Shell. Not that one, the other one. Um, well, I've got a sponsored beer here as well, which I might have. Okay, go on. Uh, so I've got the, um, I can't even read it. Oh, it's the Goddess Ravishing Rye. Whoa, there you go. There take, a go. Fucking, take a photo of that, mate. Fair bit, fair bit going on there. Hang on, wait up. There's your, there's your thumbnail for the uh, YouTube. Yep. Go thumbs up again. I missed it. <laughs> Brilliant. All right, let's have a look here. Tell you what, they're doing a few red beers lately because we had the Cerberus as well from Helios. Uh, this is a red rye beer. The rye is very interesting. Mm, don't mind a bit of rye. It's not bad. A bit of spice? A little bit, yeah. You can overdo it. Mm. The old rye. Yeah. Oh my god, that's an amazing red color. You probably well, can't see show, that on the show camera. Show a bit of light there. Look, have you got a have you got a bit, bit of light behind it with your phone, maybe? Or um, it looks maybe. like it. Let's see if I can do that. That might be getting a bit fancy there. If, there we go. There we go. Look How's at that. that? Holy moly! That, that looks that look? amazing. Hang on a second. I got to take a photo <laughs> of that. <laughs> I'm getting my my, my beer's getting light struck, but fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> that looks so good. Look at that color. That's amazing. That was really good. Um, let's have a smell and a taste, shall we? Hmm. What sort of is it? Red red IPA was it? A red rye. Ravishing red rye, it's called. Okay. Red rye ale. What kind of aromas are you getting there? very um it's quite assertively bitter there's mm. a lot of malt complexity going on it's like it's got some it's got some caramel but it's also got this nice sort of toffee note happening with it as well yeah what's so ABV I, on that uh, that's one of the things bit of feedback for Helios it's hard to 
find the ABVs. Mm. Okay, it's 1.9 standard drinks. That's so probably going to put it up around the six ish. Six percent. Oh, here we go. Six point three percent. Yeah. Yeah, they like they like their hops, don't they? That the the beers are all, yeah. always pretty pretty yeah. out there. There's not it's it's not if you're looking for a, like a really hoppy aromatic beer, it's not mm. that, but it's got some wonderful, nice uh, firm bitterness, which is in balance because there's a lot of malt going on in here as well, mm. and a good amount of um, <clears throat> hop flavour. I've no idea what hops are in it. Might even say on there. Let's see. Um, I can't even read that. My glasses aren't even working. Okay. Um, but bloody right. wonderfully, malt, wonderful amount of malt complexity there. Good beer. Good beer. We like we've got a good mix of yeast-driven beer and malt-driven beer. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, now, for a bit of a call to action, what, what would you do if you're a fan of this podcast and you wanted well, to kind of get in on the action a bit more? Well, well, Dan, that's an excellent question. So if you are a fan of this podcast and we invite you to come and join us and the conversation uh, around uh, shit posting and the occasional meme and that sort of thing, uh, you can head to our Facebook group, which is at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash boss and the brewer, or you can go to boss and the brewer.com. You can sign up to the email list, which we've never emailed out to, no. um, or you can send us an email and give Dan some shit. You can, I don't know, actually, send nudes. I, do you want nudes? I, I don't know. I, Sure, yeah. yeah send nudes. I'm, I'm cool for whatever. Um, I got an email the other day. I got well, I got a I've got a message from a potential sponsor, uh, Paul, who's who's one of the 12, and he said, I sent you an email. So then I checked the email and there was indeed an email there. So that's the what, first was that the email. only one? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's fucking great. It's working. I Fuck, actually, I haven't checked it this week. Let, let me check right now. You never know. You never know what you'll find. You in never know what's going to happen. Might be just sponsors, 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 sponsors. There is everywhere. zero. There's zero. Ah, well. That's okay. Easy come, easy go. All right. Uh, okay. So join us in the group. The first, we've got a few stories. Um, the first one, I, I have to con uh, admit, I haven't actually looked at this first one. I'm looking at it now. But it's a Bruce News article, ABS Explores Alcohol Consumption. Um, I noticed, I'm just having a look at it now. Why would the ABS be exploring alcohol consumption? I know that's their job because they do statistics, but. Mm. Um, uh, risky drinking rates are falling for men and women and young 18 to 24 year olds are showing themselves as a generation of moderation. Do you reckon that's because they're into other shit and not alcohol? Or... Yeah, they're on the pingers. Yeah. Do you think that's true? Fucking nice. Young kids are still getting fucked up, aren't they? Of course they are. They're just on the pingers. They're not on alcohol. Mm. And, you know, it's, um, um, and this is all anecdotal. <laughs> I'm, I, think I don't think I know be, anyone in, in I that. Think it's, I think it's, well, I, I, can, I can speak to some, some family members and stuff like that. And, yeah, right. um, um, and um, yeah, it's expensive for them to go drinking. You know, mm. um, you know, it's it's like if they go to a club or something like that, they're not going to leave the house till like nine or ten or eleven o'clock at night or something like that. So they're going to be preloading beforehand, mm. and it's 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 really rare. I actually, yeah, I, I I hung out with my niece and nephew, um, my nephew's birthday party a couple of weeks ago, and um, it was just a Sunday sesh sort of thing. And they were all saying it's actually really rare for us to get together and, and drink. Mm. But when they did, fucking hell, they went hard. They sent it. But um, um, but you know, um, you know, sort of anecdotally speaking, I, I don't think that uh, I just think that, that that the younger generation, it's become very expensive to drink, it's becoming very expensive to go out, to go mm. out in Brisbane, it's fucked to get home. Because Ubers mm. and taxis and everything, they're all shit these days. Yeah. And so why bother? Yeah, fair enough. I'm just looking yeah. at this. People drinking uh, less than two standard drinks a day is more common. So I, I wonder I wonder if, um, 
Do you, do you worry about shit like this when you think about, like, I, I know, like, alcohol, you know, like, we're in an industry where we're making a product that's not particularly good for you, especially if you, like, drink lots of it. Yeah. So you don't want to encourage that. But, like, it's not it's not a particularly good sign for an industry, is it, if people are consuming less of the product that you make, right? I, um, is your business growing at the moment? Well, my business and is has growing, it, but... Has it, yeah. has it grown year on year since its inception? Hmm. Beer consumption has been falling in this country, I believe, for around 20 years. Right, right. And so what that basically says is that people are drinking for uh, quality and not effect. Uh, do you think so? Yeah. Yeah. But then I think, so. I think if, if, if people weren't drinking at all for effect, I think... You would only have non-alcoholic not the ex- They're not, not drinking to the exclusion of effect. Right. Yeah. They just say, they just if they're choosing to drink, to have a drink, they want it to be a good quality one. Mm. They're prepared to pay a premium for it. Right, and they can afford to as well. And that's, that's, that's a thing that I'm a little bit concerned about is, is like, I don't know, probably not the, not the topic for this podcast, but I just don't know how people are going to be able to afford any of the shit for much longer. Like the cost of everything is going up. It's kind mm. of terrifying. Yes. Um, yeah, scary stuff. Yeah. Like if you look at, I was listening to a podcast the other day that I listened to talking about the price of fertilizer and some of the chemicals that go into fertilizer going up by like 5X in the last few months since the yeah. war started. Yes. Um, and if the price of fertilizer goes up by like four, five, 600%, then basically every crop that is consumed by people around the world is becomes unaffordable. Like it's the, the downstream consequences of some of this mm. stuff is fucking terrifying. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And if you look at like fuel prices and house prices, rent, it's just, I just don't understand how this, how this is going to work. How, how are your unit costs out of curiosity? Well, we haven't noticed a lot of big changes recently but some of this stuff you, takes you, a long you, time well you contract a lot of you know you contract malt, you contract hops so you kind of yeah. set for a while you do you i mean i know you know with your pale malt you've got a contract for the side the big silo at the front of BH2. yeah yeah oh yeah yeah right so that's a year long that'll be a year long contract i would imagine yes oh yeah the contract the hop contracts are years years in advance and your hop contracts are years in advance you got yeah. and you got a pale malt contract for years in advance that covers yeah. most of your raw materials yeah, so I mean, that's why it's like kind of a delayed. Like, I think that I think there's a lot of grain produced in Ukraine too, right? Because not not the I assume not that we use, but that a lot yeah. of people do use. Yes, and, and um, a lot of a lot of fertilizer is produced in Russia because yeah. the main input for fertilizer is natural gas. Yes, and the natural gas price is, is going through the roof. And oh, I know. Russia's- I drive and I drive a car that runs an LPG. Oh, do you? Yeah. Right. Okay. Dollar, I paid a dollar twenty a litre today. And you think about fuel too, like like if the, the fuel price where it is. There's there's very few industries that that is not going to really hurt, including ours. Like no, the amount definitely. of like like we're in the business of sending a beverage around and a bulky one of that fuel powered vehicles. Like yeah. and and to get that beverage made, we're in the business of receiving goods from fuel powered yeah. vehicles, and it's just That's like. Right. When something doubles, it's a, we're talking about a lot of fucking money. Oh yeah, oh yeah, so, yeah. yeah. I, I don't, I don't have the um, ability to predict what how that's going to end. But anyway, like you say, people are not drinking as much perhaps because they can't can't afford to, and maybe there'll be more of that. Yeah. Well, if you have a look at this this article here from uh, from Brews News, it's sort of saying. Um, comparing people's drinking during COVID to 12 months, they're drinking 12 months prior, two thirds say that their consumption has stayed about the same. One in four had reported decreased consumption and fewer than one in 10 record, record, reported increased consumption. Mm. So, you know, um, um, you know, I can, I can sort of speak personally to, to decreasing my alcohol consumption because during COVID it was like, when we had our first lockdowns and stuff like that, just on the piss every Centre, day. Yeah, but that was, it was like pretty brief for us, wasn't it? It was like it was yeah, like but three no, or four no. Weeks. But one thing that did happen is like you know I um um had a bit of a minor health scare as a result of that because I was drinking mm. pretty hard every day and that's sort of, just fucking nothing to do. 
Mm. And a um, bit of a minor health scare and that's all fine and that sort of thing. So just relax or 12 you, it's fine. And um, I'm getting phone calls right well. My phone's on airplane mode, but if it wasn't, I would be. Yeah. And um, and so, um, and it was kind of a bit of a wake up call because I'm, you know, my late 40s and I'm, um, uh, you know, just got to get into that age where you get a little bit fragile and that sort of thing. And so, <laughs> I was just like, all right. So I just, I just stopped, I just stopped drinking Mondays to Thursdays, and I haven't really yeah. missed it, to be fair. Mm. So I, I'd actually, I would actually probably say, if they had interviewed me for this, I would say that my, I'd be in that twenty-four percent that said that they had re- reported a decrease in consumption. Yeah, I have, a, I have a very strong sense that surveys are generally bullshit. Yeah, it's and just what pe- and what people say is not what they do. Hmm. But yeah, I don't know. Interesting, I don't isn't know. It? Um, all right. Uh, easy times flood relief. That was a fun I day. I, yeah, I yeah, I, th- I put this on here because I thought I figured you probably went to it and I, I thought it was a really awesome thing they did. They pulled together a bunch of people, they raised seven and a half thousand dollars. It came together really quickly. So yeah, so they had like uh they had a, a raffle. Um, with lots of prizes, they had an auction, and I bid hard, man, for the V8 supercar hot lap. Missed out. How much did that go for? I don't. I think it's about a grand. I got up to eight hundred bucks. Yeah. Missed out. But it was for an excellent cause. I believe that they raised was about eighteen. Seventy five. Yeah. Seventeen and a half. Yeah. And so that was great to see a lot of karma kegs on like easy times got 20 taps and that sort of mm. thing. So they had a lot of karma kegs on um, great bunch of people, um, you know, shout out to the easy times crew for just putting that together so quickly. Mm. Uh, you know, that was mostly Russell Steele who put together, you know, all the prizes and raffles and auctions and all that sort of stuff. There was a, it was a, the prizes were all very festival heavy. There was, <laughs> things to meet stock and all the things that Russell does. He got tickets and all that sort of thing. Oh, and, nice. That's good. And so he just did an amazing job in pulling all that together. And um, yeah, it was a great day. Really good fun day. Brilliant. Is Russell one of the 12? I don't, I don't think he is. Is he? I don't know if he's in here. I might, I, I might, in I'll message him after this and say, we were talking you up. We'd like you to be one of the 12. He could be an honorary 12. Maybe. Well, I think that's fair. Yeah, because he he's he's the sort of guy we we need on board. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Well, on a more somber note, and I put this in here. I I, I didn't know Wags, and I was reading these articles. Um, I I just kind of assumed you probably did because you were you were yeah. living in Melbourne and you you know you know everyone. <laughs> yeah, but, um, Wags, Mark Waghorn, um, who was sort of headed up sales at. Uh, Moondog Brewing Company um, sadly passed away last week uh, after a um, pretty long battle with cancer. And um, I was a bit shocked actually when I had seen, when I saw the news, because um, I knew that he was sick. And because you could kind of read between the lines of, you know, what was going on on Facebook and that sort of thing. And he was off doing stuff. And I think what he was doing was just living his best life, you know, and Mm. um, he was doing some cool stuff, spending some time with his, uh, with his wife and kids and, and, um, you know, Nikki and the kids just must be feeling like absolute shit at the moment. Um, It's really sent a ripple through the Australian craft brewing industry because WAGS is just, I mean, this industry is full of amazing people, but Mm. Wags is the upper echelon, you know, of the re- of the really good bunch of people in the industry. He, um, I first met him when he was working, when he was heading up sales at Mountain Goat. Okay, um, yeah. Back in sort of the early mid 2010s, 20 teens. And, um, you know, Mountain Goat was, this is before they sold and, mm. Mountain Goat was absolutely going from strength to strength, national distribution. Uh, it was fucking everywhere. Yeah. And, um, um, you know, the day that, that Mountain Goat announced they were sold, he, he quit. He just didn't want to be part of a, 
a, a, a non-independent brewing company and, wow. and he quit that he quit that day and mm. um uh and um so he then went to did a bit of time at temple um and then did an amazing job at temple building up a small brewery in brunswick from nothing to pretty broad distribution uh and then i think and then he found himself at, at moondog and and if you have a look at you know moondog's history over the last five years or so um it, you know he's he's just built that business into an absolute bloody powerhouse and mm. you know what it's like you know you've got to have a a bloody good person heading up your sales. Mm. Um, yeah. And um, and that was WAGS, you know, and and my personal experience with WAGS was he always had time for you, you know. He knew everybody in the business. Mm. And but he would always spend time with you. And I remember when I was running um Brew Colt and he would he would pull me, we'd we'd been at an event or something like that. He'd pull me aside, he goes, He'd ask, he says, how's, the, how's the, the beer sales going? And I'd sort of, you know, go into a bit of details about how the sales are going and the challenges and stuff like that. And then he would just give information. He would talk about pricing strategy, doing deals, building relationships, this distributor, that wholesaler, you know, the pros and the cons. And he just gave it all away. And, yeah. um, um, and, you know, some of that advice, you know, I took on board and, um, you know, that that really helped the business at the time. Um, but I think the important thing there was that Wags just, he just, he was just, he just had time for everybody, you know, and I don't, I don't think he saw the, the, beer, the brewing industry can be very, very competitive, but I think he, transcended that he did compete but he would prefer to collaborate you yeah. know what i mean and um yeah i was pretty i was yes yeah, i was pretty um yeah pretty pretty moved by um you know his passing and his uh his wake is on next uh next tuesday at moondog world um and um uh, yeah, I, I think um, I, I can just sense there's going to just going to be a hell of a lot of people there, and he's just going to be very, very sadly missed. Hmm. Well, it's a nice. That's really nice words, Endo. I think that's a really nice did, quality. Did you ever some, meet him? Someone to have. I don't think so. I, I um I know the guys from. I've met a couple of times the guys from Moondog, um, like a couple of the founders, but just sort of randomly at, at random things. I haven't spent a lot of time in Melbourne, so I don't know yeah. a lot of people. From the yeah, scene, but, well, yeah. you know, because I was in Melbourne, you know, for seven or eight years or something like that, it was like everyone in the industry got to, you know, knows everyone. It's like up here, so everyone in the industry knows each other. Mm. And, um, um, you know, uh, yeah, there, it's it, he, he he really brought together, a, a, you know, it was kind of the glue of the Melbourne craft beer, craft beer, craft beer industry, basically. Yeah. You know, both, both between the breweries, the sales teams through to the, the venues, the hospitality venues and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, phenomenal, phenomenal effort there, Wags. And the the way you miss him. The way you talk about him, it sounds like he's kind of all of the good things about this industry. Because it is, it is, yeah, it is a unique. I, I haven't worked in an industry like this where you do have people like that that you know that really bring people together and are not that focused on competing and they really just want to share information and help each other. Yeah. And that's that it is the best thing about this industry. It says it yeah. sounds like he was that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, yeah, he was basically the epitome of what all the good shit that happens in this industry. Hmm. And I think that 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 you know, in the future, I think that the industry can could could take a leaf out of Wags's book and be more like that and not forget our roots because you know when when wag sort of started you know in the business of of, of selling beer um you know it was a much different industry back then there were much fewer breweries but even as the industry grew he, he didn't change his attitude you know and and i think it's that sort of attitude that's really going to help the industry grow into the future we can't turn on each other mm. like the uh, like the 
the other craft breweries in this industry, I don't see as competition. The competition is Lion and CUB, as far as I'm concerned. And yeah. um, and he knew that, and he was he was pretty steadfast in in be, being part of an independent brewing company. Yeah, right. kind words, Hendo. Thanks, man. Very sad. Um, all right, we've got the, the next one. I, I actually only just put these in today because these came through today, and they're not neither are specifically sort of beer related, but they're right. newsworthy for us. The first one is Birchall are doing a crowdfunding raise. For Birchall. Um, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. So, so, so Birchall as a company is one of many companies um, that are getting behind the equity crowdfunding thing yeah, they, in Australia. So, what do, so explain what Birchall do. So before equity crowdfunding, you would do rewards-based crowdfunding. So you would mm-hmm. say, okay, if you want to invest in Black Ops, you, you get a carton of beer for your 100 bucks. And, and, mm-hmm. and, we, and we did that. Um, and that was the only way you could do it. But w- when Birchall started, they started working with the government uh, as they were changing the legislation to allow people to actually own parts of companies. And they were one of the first companies to launch a platform to enable people to do that. So, um, and this has taken off. Obviously, you see, you see crowdfunding news all the time. It's become a really big thing. And th- those guys are... Like I've known them for a very long time. I was really keen on this crowdfunding thing. I was talking to them well before it was legal. You know, I've dealt with them for a very long time. They're great operators. They're great people. They're doing extremely well. Um, and they've helped a lot of breweries. Like if you think about, like bre- like you, you'd be the first to admit, I know you said you don't want to invest in breweries, but I'm sure you'd be the first to admit that breweries need money. It's just, sure. it's an incredibly capitally intensive business. And yeah, and it's interesting that they're that like, I'm guessing their business is going well. They're profitable. They have been for quite a while. They they seem they seem to really know what they're doing, and the ability to invest in the investment vehicle for so many other companies is probably pretty appealing to people. It seems a little bit perception. It is the equity meta. crowd. The, ec- the equity yes. crowdfunding platform is raising money through equity crowdfunding. Exactly. Like, have a look at the fucking URL for it. It's virtual.com forward yeah. slash company forward slash virtual. Yep. You're inside. Inside. I did the EOI. The EOI is open. I'm, I'm keen to chuck some money on. I reckon they're really? a great team. Oh, yeah. I think they're great. I bet that Matthew Vitali bloke before. Oh, he's awesome. He, he's he's the, the nicest guy you'll ever meet. He's yeah. super smart, super helpful. He's great. And Alan is great. The other, like the other co-founder. Alan Crab, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're great people, great business. I, I, I'm just super interested to see. I love equity crowdfunding because, like for one reason, is because peop, the companies are forced to reveal information as if they were kind of like a listed company. You know, yeah. like private companies don't have to reveal any of this information, so we don't know anything. Yes. But I'm keen to see what the what the finances look like for a company like that. Like, they take 6% of every raise. Um, yeah, so right. you're talking about, like for our raise, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and they're doing multiple raises. So I'm guessing that, you know, it's a serious business they got going. That's, uh, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Um, and they, they say they raised over $100 million. So there $6 million. Dollars. What are they going to do with the um, money? Well, one thing they mentioned in the EOI email is they're working on virtual trade, which will be um, basically a platform to allow people to buy and sell shares after they've invested, which is super critical because at the moment you can buy shares in companies, but you can't really sell them. And that's not an equity crowdfunding thing. That's for any private company. It's just no one really talked about it before. But like if you own shares in a private company, you can't just go out and sell them on a marketplace somewhere. No, of course not. It's you hang on They're, to them forever. So basically, they want to be a market maker and put well, some and give some sense of liquidity to those yes. who have invested through it to, into equity crowdfunding. Yeah, the challenge is going to be, and and I'm hoping this gets resolved. But at the moment, if you want to set up a platform for, is my understanding of it, and I'm not a lawyer, and this is not legal advice, or town planning advice, or, or financial advice, advice. <laughs> financial advice. <laughs> 
But if, yeah, if you want to set up a platform to enable shareholders to sell shares to each other, the company structure needs to be public unlisted company, which right. is, which requires a lot of changes, a lot more oversight. You have to get external audits and things like that. It's not yes. something that, it, that businesses are going to really particularly want to do. Um, so that's going to be a big barrier. If people have to do that to do the share trading, it'll be a big barrier. It's something I've considered yeah. and, and will consider for Black Ops. Sure. If they change that rule, it will be an absolute game changer because it'll be basically like a mini stock exchange for private companies. Yes. Which is yeah. brilliant because I think... It's kind of like off, off market kind of trading or something yeah. like that, yeah. Yeah. So I think the way theirs will work is it won't be like an active market like the ASX that just kind of goes up and down every day. It'll be like every year you do a campaign amongst your existing shareholders where you enable them to buy and sell shares from each other or get new people in to buy shares from the existing shareholders as like a, a campaign of sorts. It's not an ongoing. Yeah, right. That's my understanding of it. It'd um, be good if they pull that off. I think so. I think it would, it would solve, you know, arguably the, really the, the biggest kind of problem with equity crowdfunding, which is you can buy shares and they're very difficult to sell. Yes. Yeah. Or private investment full stop. If you're not a sophisticated investor, you kind of, kind of never, never sell your shares. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking hell. That's interesting. Um, I would like to keep tabs on how that goes is so what are, where, where are they at at the moment? EOI. Well, yeah, it's EOI. So I, I put in the EOI. So mm -hmm. when they open next week... Um, so 19 days, one hour, 49 minutes and 49 seconds. Okay, so, so, not, okay. so a couple of EOI. weeks. EOI. So a couple of weeks, nearly three weeks. I'll report back on what they're offering and whether I invested. Yep. And I don't know, maybe we could get Matt on the show. I'm sure he'd be happy to come on. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Um, I... I thought I was over this problem with the dog, but he's sitting here like like licking my feet profusely. Right. Has um, Elon got a bit of a foot thing now over the know. humping? I didn't think so. Out. Out. Hey, you didn't say before you needed a new house. What the fuck is going on? Oh, there? fuck me. Yeah. Yeah, well, I... You know, as you know, I'm building a house. Yes. Stop, get off my feet, you weird animals. Um, and yeah, I'm in a rental that I knew was going to come to an end and I've sort of just been waiting for her to say, yeah, I actually need the house back. And she's said that. So I've got about a week to move out. And it's- Fuck, what a it is, shit time to rent in on the oh, Gold Coast. I, I don't, it is impossible. Like I've, yeah, I'm, there's, there's other people with worse problems than me, but it's, it's pretty hard. I've been rejected by about 10 places putting in applications for places that I don't look at. It's it's really, really hard work to find a rental. Fuck. Yeah. Wow. That's scary, man. And someone did put forward you as a potential place to house me yes. and the foot foot licking dog for a while. But yes. I, I made it very clear that I would not live under the half lexicon walls under and any circumstances. Full lexicon or get the fuck out. Exactly. Okay. Or vivid white. Your call, man, you weirdo. <laughs> Walls and ceilings, vivid white or full lexicon. They're my two conditions. Fuck me. I think I just threw right. up in my mouth a little bit. <laughs> All right. Story, story number four. Oh, actually, let me <clears throat> let me get to this one because this one's super interesting. Right, yeah. We submitted our beers to the A and I haven't seen any news about this. And, and I hope I'm not sort of misreading what's going on, but we submitted our beers to the Abers, which are the premier beer awards in Australia. Yeah. Um, and every year you kind of submit, it's kind of part of the challenge to, you know, find the category for your beer. Because if you release something, um, you know, if, it's, if you call it an IPA and it's 6%, but it yes. doesn't match that style guideline, you submit it in a category that's not an IPA, you submit to some other category. Yes, yes. But they've replied and said, actually, from this year on, um, you have to release, you have to submit a beer to the category in which it is marketed as. So if you market your beer as, so for example, they've got this new but category. What we should do, man, is read out what they said. Okay, I'll read out what they said. Yeah. Thanks for entering continued support for Davis. After reviewing your entries, I found an issue with your goat and hornet entering the classes that are different to what is stated on the commercial label of the beers. 
Labeling rule is a new rule we brought in to avoid an IPA winning a pale ale trophy. Explanation being from page seven of 2022 booklet. Exhibits must be entered in their correct class according to style. The style of beer stated on the commercial label must match the class entered. For example, if the style of beer stated on the commercial label is India Pale Ale, then the beer must be entered into an India Pale Ale class. Note that an exhibit will not be eligible to win a trophy if the commercial name of the entry stylistically differs from the class it was entered into. Um, and if you recall, they've got a new, a new category this year called a uh, fucking hazy strong pale ale or something, right? Yes, okay. Which is basically every, like, every top hazy in Australia is kind of like marketed as a hazy IPA, like goat sure. is a hazy IPA, Bolter yep. hazy, hazy IPA, yep. that's what we call yep. them. No yep. one calls it a hazy strong pale ale. So this new yep. category basically yep. cannot be used. Yep. So this is weird and problematic. Yes. And I'm keen to hear your thoughts on it. Do you know the history of what happened with the RBAs and why they're doing this? I'll go on. I, I don't. Right. This goes back to, I'm going to say around 10 years ago, somewhere between 10, 2010, 2012, maybe even a little bit before, actually, when Hop Hog won yeah. the uh, champion beer at the RBAs and, um, and, and, and champion pale ale, right? Now, Hop Hog, what style of the beer is it? Well, they changed it, didn't they? Right. But what, when it was the old green label, what did it say? Well, it, it was originally an IPA. You said India Pale Ale, right? Yes. Okay. Now, um, so what had happened was um, Hop Hog won, champion, uh, won the champion Pale Ale and then champion beer. I think it was two years running at the RBAs, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, and it won as an American style Pale Ale even though it had IPA written on it. Now, the no thing problem. is at the time, right, um, that's all that could have been entered into, okay? Because at, the, because at the time, there was no, in the BA style guidelines, there was no American style strong pale ale, okay? So you had American style pale ale, and then you had American style India pale ale. Now, the thing is, right, is that, um, American style pale ale, and, and by that style, if, if, you're, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, what is an American style pale ale? Think Sierra Nevada pale ale. Right? Yeah. That, that is the, the quintessential uh, American style pale ale. Okay? Its ABV range for the style goes up to 5.6%. Okay? But then, um, uh, but then um, uh, American style India pale ale doesn't kick in until 6.4%. Mm -hmm. So there was this big gap of ABV in the middle where people were making hoppy beers in this thing and it had nowhere to fit, right? It definitely wasn't an American-style India Pale Ale. Hop Hog was never an American-style India Pale Ale, but it was a very bloody good um, um, American-style Pale Ale, okay? Um, and the reason why in Australia we market these beers around the 6% mark. So we show it between 5.8 and 6.2%, right? Everyone has it in their fucking core range, this thing, and they call it an IPA. Hmm. And the reason why we do it is because of our excise rules. It's just cheap. It's just a good sweet spot for alcohol yeah. and sell price, you know, RRP and all that sort of stuff. That ABV just works well. Okay? Yeah. And so they're quite popular in Australia. Um, I don't know how popular they are elsewhere, but they, that, that particular type of beer is popular in Australia. So anyway, after um, Hop Hog won two years in a row, there was a very vocal minority who complained to the RESV, who run the ARBAs, uh, sorry, the Royal Agricultural Society of Victoria, and said, that beer can't win champion start pale ale. It says IPA on the label. Okay. Now, as far as I'm concerned, and as a judge in the ARBAs, that's fucking irrelevant. 100%. Right. Because when we judge the beers, we don't see the label. No. Right? It's, not, it's not about and, label. It's not about marketing. It's about... It's not about labels. It's not about marketing. It's, it's about the liquid that's inside the bottle or the can or the glass, right? And, 
and whether that judge believes you know, we, we have a liquid and we have some words that describe the style and our job as judges is to is to determine whether um, uh, that liquid matches those words. End of story. 100%. Okay. Now, judges are pretty savvy. And if you try and enter an American style IPA into American style pale ale, let's say you manage to fudge it and all sorts of stuff. We can tell if something's got slightly higher alcohol. We can tell if it's got slightly elevated bitterness and should be categorized elsewhere. All right. Um, and so I don't believe that this rule, this rule is, is a situation that goes back 10 years. Why, but and why are they sudden, changing? Why is this happening? Well, that's, now? this is the thing that I find con confusing is why are they suddenly enforcing it? And a, a year when the, they're bringing in a new style, which is the most popular style of beer, yeah, that then no one's going to be able to enter because no one markets it. At, to me, it would it would appear as if um, the um, the RSV is trying to pander to a vocal minority, and they should tell that vocal minority to just sit down, mm. sit down. You don't you just you, you're bitching about the fact that you didn't your beer didn't do well, right? And you and you're doing the what aboutism. What about this? What about that? And um, and so why they're suddenly enforcing it 10 years after the situation happened? 10 years, mm. that's what I'm saying here. I don't understand that, right? And um, so uh, maybe there's something more recent that's happened about that. Well, um, it, happens, it's made... it definitely happens regularly that, like, I know with, with our stuff, like when we, when we won in the Queensland Awards, for example, I think last year, year before or whatever, we won best IPA. Um, let me get this right. Code Red won best IPA. Hornet, which is actually our IPA, won best pale ale yes. or best strong pale ale or, or, or whatever, because that yep. was that was like exactly the scenario you just described. Yep. We call them IPAs in Australia, but we put them at about 6% because that's what people want to drink. And that's the sweet spot for excise and price and whatnot. Um, yes. But at no stage is anyone... As far as I'm aware, at least from my point of view, as said, like this is a really bad situation that you a beer that you market as an IPA is winning a parallel category. It was just kind of like, oh, that's funny. That's not the not not the words you use when you market it. But if it feels to me like, mm -hmm. and and you you might be right that it's just a vocal minority and they're kind of accepting that. But it feels to me that they that they are trying to dictate how people market beers. I don't think they're trying to do that. I don't think they're trying to do that. I, I know exactly what's going on is that, they're, is that they're trying to avoid people questioning the results of the ARBAs. And I think this is a thing to try and preserve the integrity of the competition. I think it'll do the opposite. But I think it's going to have the opposite effect, I would agree, is that, you, you know, like I'm going to enter a beer, um, you know, and I can get away with this. <laughs> So I'm going to enter some beers for Brownstone, and I'm this one of these beers, the IPA, IPA for Brownstone, which I usually enter into international style pale ale, right? Um, uh, goes it yeah, goes into the international style pale ale uh, category or class, mm. uh, and um, this year it's up for the um, medal of consistency. Consistency, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it'd be third if it wins a gold medal, it's third year in a row, it's medal mm. of consistency. I'm scared that if I enter this in the same class that it's been entered in the last five years, they're going to say no. So I think I'm just going to write in the entry thing, Brownstone International Pale Out IPA. Well, that's the thing. Like, are they, like, like who, so are what they did, looking what at you, how you market? Like, how do they define marketing as beer? about they your the particular circumstances. So with GOAT, um, what did you originally try to enter it into? I'm not going to be able to answer these questions because Eddie does the entrance. Eddie does I, I only know about this because Eddie sent this to me and he's like, oh, this is a bit weird. Yes, um, it's weird. Look, yeah. now, don't, don't get me wrong. I, I love the RSV and I love the ALBAs and, and everything they do. I don't understand this. Well, I hope, I other, I hope the other... I don't understand why don't they're enforcing a rule from a situation that happened 10 years ago, literally 10 years ago. Um, I sincerely hope that you managed to find a resolution with the RSV around this. Um, 
I certainly, you know, I, I don't want to, um, you know, bring the competition into disrepute or anything like that. I'm certainly not going to complain about it. They obviously have their reasons. Do I agree with it? No. Hmm. I don't know what's going on in the background, um, but their comp, their rules. Yeah. Well, and I, at the end of the day, that they, they, they can they can they make the rules. <laughs> that's true. I, I I don't really see an upside to it, and there, there may be no. one that I'm not seeing. I don't know if you could. I don't even know if you could argue the toss over it. To be fair. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, I'm not like super concerned. It's not like the end of the world for us, but I just think it's a weird rule change and it doesn't make any sense. And I kind of I entered, the, I entered the milk stout from Brownstone and I called it, um, um, what was it? Oh, what did I call it? I called it, uh, a tr uh, it was called the Wurt Whisperer, a tribute to Grum Knight of Exit Brewing. Oh, yeah. Nice. Because I was just... Him. That's the guy I yeah. got the selfie with that time and sent it yeah. to you because, yeah, I remember him. Um, and, you got a beer um, there, Hendo? Yeah, I got another beer there. And um, and so Grum's Milk Stout always wins a gold medal at the AIBAs. Bloody good Milk Stout. And, um, uh, and uh, yeah, it was uh, and it was good. What it might They got a silver medal that year, but Grum won the fucking gold medal again. But I had to show him afterwards to say it was called the Wurt Whisperer because Grum gets called the Wurt Whisperer because he's very good. Nice. And nice. Um, yeah, let's see here. What do we got here? Events. Days. 2022. I'm to find that rule. What rule did they say? What page did they say the rule was? I'm opening a beer and I did it really close to the microphone for extra dramatic effect. What rule? What, what page did they say that rule was on? Page, do, 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 page seven of the entry booklet. Page seven, yeah. Entries must be. Entries must be commercially available, but you can only enter once. Must be into the correct class according to the style. Style beer stated on the commercial label must match the class entered. If the style of beer stated is commercial label is India Pale Ale, then the beer must be entered into India Pale Ale class. I don't agree with that. It's pretty funny it's, because, like, are they actually going to check all these labels? Like, a lot of the time, you don't even put yeah. the style of beer on the label. And people, like, a lot of the time, this stuff is made up. Like, if you think of, like, an easy drinking beer, right, it could be a... Easy drinking ale these days could be a session ale, it could be a Pacific ale, it could be a refreshing That's ale, crazy. it could be a just an ale. Sentence. An exhibit will not be eligible to win a trophy if the commercial name of the style stylistically differs from the class it was entered into. So this has happened as well in other things as well. Um, again, Feral. Um, do you remember when Boris, the Imperial yes. Stout, won a trophy? Right. Um, that was entered as a imperial porter yeah it happens all the fucking time it's not a problem i don't know if i agree with this anyway what have i got here i've got a beer uh this is the what have you got there more chunks oh uh, you've got a blaster beer then i've got a um blaster but this is this is the hefeweizen and i've got the i've got the glass yeah. for it Look at the head on now that. You, now you've got the right glass. And exactly. you caught it really well as well. So oh, good. Yeah, good on you. Uh, I've got the uh, Long Stocking Bira Festiva. Oh, is this a sponsor or no? Uh, no, no, it's just a client sent me beer. Okay. Uh, and I saw this in the fridge and I was like, oh, actually, so this is supposed to be an Italian Pilsner. And I've never had an Italian Pilsner. Do you know what an Italian Pilsner is? Well, yeah, it's probably the category we enter in fucking later into the Abers because we can't, find the actual real category and you choose the one that matches the style and that's probably an Italian Pilsner. Mm. So Italian Pilsner is supposed to be um, like a German Pilsner, like it's a lot of aromatic hops, like you know, Hellertau, Middlefru or Tetanang or something like that, those noble hop varieties. But then yep. they dry hop it, right? This has got your name fucking written all over this style of beer. Yes, no, hopped. actually Ian, Ian was telling me about this. And they yeah. dry hopped with those noble varieties, which is actually really uh i won't say rare but it's quite germans don't dry hop beer no they just don't and uh, italians will go yeah we love the aromatics of these hops let's dry hop it mm. so putting on so the red flannel and it i'm dry it? hopping it yeah no, it sounds like a job for me not a whole lot of head on that beer is it no nah. 
bad. It's not particularly hoppy. Let's have a look here. Beer of Estiva or summer beer is, is in Italian is a classic taste inspired by the Amalfi Coast from Positano and Amalfi itself. This is a refreshing Italian style lager. Okay, it's not Italian pills, it's Italian lager. It's like beer of Meridian or something like that. Yeah. Perfect for the Australian summer. It actually is pretty bloody close to what is it? What is it? Beer of Meridian? What's that other one? Oh, couldn't it? Uh, Peroni and all that sort of stuff. Uh, yeah. It's actually pretty yeah. close. Pretty bloody close. Nice. Okay, well, my beer doesn't disappoint. It's it, if you go to bostonbrewer.com forward slash. I'm not as good at, at this as you Master? are. No, the, the Facebook group. If you go oh, to the Facebook it's group, it's Facebook do, facebook.com forward slash groups forward okay. slash Boston the Brewer. Okay. If you go there, you will see our header image. It says Blaster 2021 Champion Independent Beer, Blaster Bison. And it says, and also one-time sponsor of the boss and the brewer, maybe 2021's champion podcasts. Maybe 2022. But anyway, that's it's it's our it's our flagship sponsored beers, and it's tasting very good. Mm. Um, all right, final news item before we get to 12 questions. What do you got? Dan Murphy's is opening a zero alcohol bar. Get fucked. Which I thought was so fucking strange and interesting and intriguing. Okay, explain the interesting and intriguing part because I don't understand this shit at all. Well, it's... This year's just gotten fucking weird <laughs> and that just made it fucking worse. <laughs> well, it's weird to me that Dan Murphy's would open a bar. It's well, a- they can. They can because there's no alcohol in it. Yeah. Okay, so are they not allowed to open an- another bar or... No, it's like it's a, aren't they, isn't it like it's a bar that's in a store? It says it's scheduled at his very first bar next week, 0% by Dan Murphy's serving zero alcohol drinks in the Melbourne suburb of Hampton. Yeah, a it's standalone, a oh, it's a fully bar. fitted bar. Oh, fuck off. I don't the understand. The highlighted the drinks will range from 0 to 0. 0.5, which are considered non-alcoholic. 100%. So it's a bar. So it's not even in a Dan Murphy store. No, it's a it's a standalone bar that only sells non-alcoholic drinks. All right. Let me pose this to you then. All right. Let's say that okay, so I'm looking at the the mock up there. It's like a bar with some umbrellas and shit at the front. Yeah. And it's called Zero by Dan Murphy's in the Dan Murphy's green. Zero percent. Yes. Zero percent by Dan Murphy's. All right. Cool. It looks like I don't want to be a hater, but it looks pretty shit. It looks out. okay. It, well, it looks yeah, yeah. That okay. Well, this is this is my question, right? So let's say they had, um, you know, drinks by Dan Murphy, the alcoholic bar. Would you fucking go to it? Well, that's my question. That's what I wonder as well. Is like it's weird enough that they're opening a bar. They would never open a bar with alcohol in it, would they? It would be weird if they did. Exactly. It would be weird, right? So it's not the fact that it's a zero alcohol bar, but it's this fact that it's just a bar. No, but it's we- it's weirder. It's, it's, it's <laughs> it, makes, so? it makes it weirder that it's zero. Well, a zero alcohol bar itself is is a challenging idea to someone who makes alcoholic beverages for a living. But a company that you wouldn't expect to own open a bar is weird enough, and then they open a zero alcohol bar is is double weird. Yeah, it's double weird. But you know what? I, I honestly, like, when I see stuff like this, I, I do, like, seriously think, like, I'm, very, I'm open-minded. I could be totally fucking wrong. And this could crush it. I, 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 maybe I'm just completely out of touch. I don't, I don't know. Mm. It seems like a really weird concept, but I am willing to be wrong. And I'm definitely going to go there and see if people get, go to it. Do you think people will go to this? I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I don't know what to fuck to think anymore about this <laughs> non-out thing. <laughs> Clearly, somebody at Dan Murphy's corporate has gone, hey, fuck, I've got this great idea. Let's open a non-alcoholic bar. All right. And they open a non-alcoholic bar. Didn't we look at that one last week? What was that one called last week that we looked at? That, that one in Sydney? It's like, uh, anyway, it was like a non-alcoholic bottle shop and bar sort of thing, mm. right? 
And then you got like the Brewdog AF bars and all that sort of thing as well. Do they I have understand. alcohol free bars? Did I, I, yeah, I they got they... Brewdog AF. Yeah. Yeah. I know they got and, beer. I didn't know they had the bars. Right. Yeah, they got bars, the AF bars. There's a, there's a Brewdog AF bar, I think, in London. And okay. um, yeah. I don't get it. I don't know. I just. But also, also the thing that's weird about this is Dan Mer like, a couple of things. One, Dan Murphy is a company that makes shitloads of money, more than any other in the country, out of selling yes. alcohol. Yes. Yes, so, and, 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 and selling off-premise. Now they're suddenly making a play mm. into on-premise. The, the other, the so other thing the other thing I'll say is whenever like a big, like, De, like Endeavor are a big, successful yeah. business and they're doing very well. Like they're very good at what they do. They're, they're kind of dominating the majors, you know, when it comes to craft products over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, and when a, when a big company does something that I think is weird, I just kind of stop and think there's probably a really good chance they know something that I don't know and that, that this is actually a really smart thing to do. Mm. And I'm willing to be wrong because it doesn't feel like that. It feels weird, but perhaps I'm wrong and it is actually a really good idea. I... I hope so. I don't know. Hey, you remember that? Um, and you still see him around in like rural areas and that sort of thing. Um, that fast food place, Oliver's. Yes. Right. It's like the healthy fast food. So instead of like a, a punt of the chips, you get a punt, punt of the fucking carrot sticks. Yeah. Right. How well is that done? They're in a fair bit of trouble over the years, I think. I can know. They've been in a fair bit of trouble. Yeah. Why? I don't know. I think it's a great idea. <laughs> Because when people want fast food, they don't want to be healthy. They're eating fast food to not be fucking healthy, right? Mm. You make that conscious decision. Fast food and healthy just don't go together, right? Yeah. It just, it just doesn't go together. And they've, they've, they've been, you're right, the, Oliver's been a lot of strife mm. over the years. Have you ever eaten a one? I have not, no. There's one in um, Chindra, isn't there? Or like just kind yeah, of I've actually eaten that one at, 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 uh, at Chindra. Yeah. Um, and um, it's a $14 sandwich. $14 sandwich. I'm a millennial. I, I, I pay $15 for smashed avocado regularly. It's, it's not a problem. Right. Fuck me. <laughs> um, and um, it just, and I think it, I think uh, if, if I remember is that like there was one guy, because I remember Coles, right? And um, there was just one guy in, in, in management, senior management in Coles, who was just adamant about this healthy fast food thing. Mm. Back in it, back in it, back in it, back in it. Fuck, I don't even know. It's still around. Yeah. You know? it's, yeah, it's still around. Um, and I think that this might be... Yeah, I remember my That was rad. That, that was rad. Why isn't that still around? That was great. You go in there, you do it yourself. They don't even have, have to have staff making it. You make it yourself. Sizzler, COVID. that was awesome. COVID. COVID, yeah. Wouldn't have survived COVID. No. But no. MOE was bloody good. Um, good. I just think that this Dan Murphy's Zero Bar is going to be like Oliver's. Okay. That's your prediction. That's my prediction. It's in Melbourne. We should go. Well, I honestly we're, we're wish them for the Abers. If it's open by then, let's fucking just at least walk past and see where what's is going. it. Where is it? Hampton. Uh, Hamptons. Hampton. I don't know Melbourne that well. You probably know Melbourne suburb of Hampton. I'm okay. googling this right now. Oh, it's okay. on the water. Let me see. Is it... Zoomers Brighton. and millennials oh, yeah. are driving south of, south of St Kilda and Brighton. And have made non-alcoholic drinks into cool. See, I don't know. Maybe we're just maybe we're missing this shit. We've got a, that, you know, that first story from Bruce News exactly. was about alcohol consumption decreasing. And then they're opening this shit. Maybe we're just old farts, just don't that's get about, it. That's that's my concern. I think we might be. I think we might, I think we might be missing this. Yeah. But aren't um sober but opening a non-alcoholic bar on the Gold Coast? Or it's it's gonna be brewery, mate. Oh, yeah, brewery. brewery and taproom, yeah. So, yeah. Um, Luke, one of the twelve, could could yeah. weigh in on this on in the Facebook group. I, and I'm 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 confused, and maybe I'm ignorant, and I will happily be, um, you know, cor corrected around what the fuck is going on with the non-alc industry. 
Yeah. I don't get it. It's not, it's not my cup of tea. Okay. Mm. Um, it would be the first person to admit that it's not my cup of tea. Yeah. Um, you know, um, and, uh, but I would like to know more just purely out of curiosity, just to see how the other half of fucking society lives. Agreed. And that's why we should go yeah. there. Let's, and it's not to, not to belittle them or berate them. I'm just genuinely curious. I am too. I about, think I'm, I'm about, keen to go there. I, I just, I'm just genuinely curious as to why the, why you would go to a bar and do something social and not have social lubrication. Don't because, understand. because a lot of people, because you go to the bar, right, to socialize, mm. and people are drinking less. So why not go to a bar? Without alcohol. I don't know. Yeah, without alcohol. So I'm going to, when we go no, there, I get we're going to go just there. Getting, I'm getting, getting a little really nervous around people either. and I just need <laughs> in oh. In Gab's week, good beer week. Are you, are you going down for good beer week? That doesn't exist. I will be. Well, there's no good beer week. No. But I'm going down for ARBA judging and then I'm flying okay. back down on the Thursday for the ARBA dinner. Okay. And I'll be there for Gab's as well. Well, what are you doing? Let's fucking go. Let's go. What fucking suburb is it? Hampton. Know. Hampton. It's near St Kilda. South of just St Kilda. Oh, okay. Brighton, oh, just south well, of there. South of Brighton. Just the next suburb. Yeah. All right. I'm we curious. Look, I tell you what. We'll do it when we're hungover. Yeah. And before a gab session. Okay. Keen. When does it open? That's a good question. I didn't actually look we at that. Getting, I don't know we, if it says. We're committing to go and... In, next in, week. In, it fucking opens next week. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. We're doing it. Um, I wonder if they have an Instagram or something. Zero percent. I'm going to look at that right now. No, I'm not because my phone's in airplane mode. Um, <laughs> all right. Let's monitor this one closely. It's very interesting. All right. We've got 12 questions. And so me. you know the rules of this segment. Um, yes. First of all, People can only ask 12 questions and there can only be 12 people asking questions. Asking questions, yes. Or multiples of 12. And the other rule is I don't look at the questions before reading them live. Neither on do the I. Show, so, and neither neither do you, I. so it could be problematic, but let's see how we go. Ah. Paul Metcalf, who I should reveal, is obviously one of the 12 and the person who emailed us with a sponsorship offer. Mm-hmm. As his first question, so that that's a future sponsor coming. What was in. the offer? Well, it was vague. What? But, I, but uh, he's sending us something, and I don't know what it is. Because you asked my address the other day, didn't you? I did. Yeah. So, have you got anything? So he's sending me something. Yeah. As well. Oh fucking hell! Right, yeah. You check your letterbox lately? Well, if it's beer, it's not going to fit in my letterbox. It's not. But I will be keep beer. an eye out. It's not going to be beer. He's, he, he does... Um, what does he do? Well, I, I think it's a new thing. I don't know what it's going to be, but it's not going to be beer. Okay. Well, right. I'm, I'm, I will check my letterbox and I eagerly await the arrival of our sponsorship, whatever it is. All right. His question is, can we arrange a Grzitski at the German club and at $12 in a 12-ounce glass? I don't know, man. Asking for a Polish beer at a German club seems risky. Okay. <laughs> Fail. Uh, do we do we reject him as a sponsor after that question? Or? No, not at all. Okay, we welcome. Uh, all. I know, to, to be fair, I'm pretty sure they would do a Grodzitski at the um, uh, at the German club. Okay, all right. <clears throat> uh, Leon Perkin, who's a okay. regular guest, and we still have never actually talked to him about Facebook groups, which was the plan. Mm. This could be worth discussion. Oh, he put the Dan Murphy zero out one in there. And then Luke I Cooper too, replied back. I, I would say that Perko would be pretty weirded out by it as well. Mm, yeah. Luke Cooper replied, sober is already lined up. I think it's an interesting concept. There are non-alcohol bottle shops opening up every week too. It is interesting. Watch, watch it with bated breath. Yeah. Uh, oh, this is really, really harsh. Luke Cooper, who, who before I read this question, we are a supporter of, mm-hmm. sponsor of the show. Yes, yes. He's asked, does, and by the way, and I turned 32 during the week, so I think this is in reference to that. Right. Does Dan now qualify for Senior Entrepreneur of the Year? 
do you qualify for Senior Entrepreneur of the Year? Yeah. Are you 32? 42, but I say 32 because it makes me feel better. You're like my mum. I am? When my mum when my mum turned 40, right, mm. she would say she turned 39 and when, when her 40th birthday rolled around, she goes, oh, I'm turning 39 and a half this year. And then it was like yeah. 39 and three quarters. Brilliant. She's 178 years old now. And she still yep. says she's 39 and 127, 128. Same. Um, Good honour. She can yeah. own that. Well, we did have the situation where Govs and Eddie got nominated for the Young Entrepreneurs and I was left out because of my age, which is mm. really harsh. So senior entrepreneur, I, I think that's cool, but there's a lot more better entrepreneurs than I am that are actually old. So I don't think I would make the cut. But thank you for your question, you fucking bastard. That's anyway. <laughs> uh, All right. Luke Cooper has got another question. Hopefully it's not as bad as that one. Uh, yeah, beneficial- that's asked 12 questions. 12, yep. Yeah. Is Beneficial Brewing too close to Bolter Brewing in terms of branding? Oh, Beneficial... Beneficial Brewing. Beer. I'm not familiar with this. In a Beneficial Beer Co. Well, let's have a look. Beneficial Beer oh, Co. No, that's DJ's beer. Jesus you know, we Christ. had DJ on the show. We talked NFTs. Beneficial... Oh, yes, I do. No, no, DJ? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So I'm looking at the can. It wasn't anything like Bolter, was it? No, he's looking. He's what he's looking at is the picture of the pint glass with the smile on it. Oh, true. Well, in defence, the smile was basically the McDonald's logo, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah, maybe. The other thing about the, the funny thing about like that kind of beer that makes you smile thing, it's just it's kind of like a pretty clear a back well, breach, isn't it? But no one no one seems to care about that. I don't know. Uh, I can see very vaguely on the uh, can there that does have the registered trademark logo. So clearly they've gone through the Madrid protocol and have registered that trademark. So is it an issue? Not if it's got a registered trademark. I think that's a, I think that's a little mock-up and that's not a real product and that's a designer's just thrown that together. But we could ask. We could ask. It does, it does look a bit boltery, doesn't it? But, you know, the, eh. Belter didn't invent the smile. It's no, no. probably free, free to use, I'd, I'd say. But also probably a breach of ABAC. I don't know. Is it? You, you probably know more about ABAC than I do. I fucking don't know. When it comes to non alk beers and ABAC, who the fuck knows what's going on there? Not you and not me. Nah. Uh, this is all new territory, man. Oh, okay. Luke Cooper, question number three of 12. When is the Blaster Brewing Company and Helios Brewing Company sponsor beer challenge or even better collaboration? Yeah, there we go. That's well, that was beer. mentioned in the Facebook group this week. Yeah. And I did see that Adzi um, was chiming in um, and was saying that there should be, that that should happen. And I believe that might happen. Blaster just really did a collab for... with Stone. Did you see Who that? Did? Blaster. Did they? Yeah. Nice. Fucking boss. Hmm? Also, Stone, I think I've read today, and, and I didn't put this in the news, I'm not sure why, but they I do know why, because I'm not a member of this website that wrote the article, that, that they were considering selling because they owe someone $500 million. Yeah, I did, did see, see that? that. Yeah. Yeah. We went to Stone it. in America. It was, was fucking amazing. Yeah, there's like one shareholder they owe a lot of money mm. to. This is what's going to happen to BrewDog, man. Same thing. It's a tough industry, mate. Mm. All right, Chris Wood. Love the excise chat last ep and want to know more. How do breweries plan and pay excise? Is it paid in advance or after the beer is sold? Um, well, basically paid the paid the. Well, you, you can probably explain it better than I can. Wow. It's, it's, mm. Okay, so um, how it works is you apply for an excise license. So it's basically a license to pay tax. Awesome. And um, you have to get all your tanks calibrated because they want to make sure that you're not bootlegging beer. And you have to keep records of all of your grain because grain equals alcohol, or ethanol, and ethanol equals excise because you pay excise based on the litres of ethanol, right? Um, and uh, so you do excise returns. What, see, everyone's able to make a different arrangement with the tax office, mm. right? It, yeah. it starts off that it's weekly and you pay weekly, right? And if you build up that level of trust and if you pay on time and that sort of thing, it might let you go monthly, right? 
and you might do monthly for a while. Um, but if you start paying late or not lodging a return or something like that, then they'll put you back on the weekly, right? So there's no, I don't think there's any hard and fast rules there. Um, and so the way that it works is you pay excise based on the amount of ethanol that leaves what's called the bonded area. So that's basically a red line where you manufacture the excise. And when it leaves there for human consumption, that is when the excise becomes payable. So you pay on the movement of the beer out of the bonded area, not when you sell it, right? So if you send your beer to an unbonded warehouse, you've still got to pay ready for sale. You've still got to pay the excise before you yeah. sell the beer. Right? It's going to be pretty, it's pretty tough like that. Yeah. Or if you sell it to, te to someone technically, who... Technically, my understanding is that the ATO owns your beer before you pay the excise. Owns it. Right? And so if your brewery burns down, um, they still get paid. Unless it's not fit for human consumption, you say it's not fit for human consumption. Um, and so, um, so yeah, it's pretty pretty strict, and you definitely do not want to get caught bootlegging alcohol in this country. No, you will get in a lot of like jail time and massive, massive fines in the hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars easily. Right? They they will yeah. get you. Um, on the flip side for a part of the ATO that generates a lot of revenue, they're horribly under-resourced. And, um, uh, and it, it's, it, it does happen, but it's hard work for the ATO to audit audits a, a brewery, right? And so, and that, but it does happen. So let's say you get audited, right? The ATO, they, they write your letter and say, Oh, they can, they can take the money out of your account without auditing you, though. Oh, yeah. Well, no, no. What they can do is they can go, we're going to audit your last two years' worth of excise returns, yeah. and you're going to have to produce all the records. You're going to have to produce your grain register, so all the grain that's been received, all the grain that goes into beer, and they're going to want to make sure that every single kilo of grain that has the potential to make alcohol got turned into alcohol, and they got paid for their alcohol. Yeah. And that, that process of auditing can take months and mm. be very costly. If you got audited, I, you, I'd just be, be very sorry for you, mate, because that's a month. You'd have to dedicate full-time staff to that audit. Yeah. Well, we figured, we figured out really early on, this is many years ago, that the ATO can just take the money off you if they feel like doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we, we looked, and this is quite a while ago, but... Um, we, we looked in our account and yeah, we're, we're, like when you start, you don't know any of this shit. Like, you know, it's going to be hard. You just don't know any of this stuff. Mm. Um, and there was a thing in there. It was like garnishy, like 10 grand. And we're like, who the fuck is garnishy? What the, what the fuck is that? Um, and kind of called the account and was like 10 grand is missing from our account. What's this garnishy shit? It's just like the ATO can just like take the money out of your account if they feel like it. Wow. Yeah. It's pretty wild. Yeah. Now um, I will so say you, know, you need to you need to be onto it and exactly and you got to and so this is the thing right and this is where I will give the ATO credit right? is that uh, you know ten years ago it was really really hard to get an excise license it would take six months to get an excise license you can get an excise license up in fourteen to twenty one days now right um, no wonder that's been it's fucking good revenue for them I'd sign up as many customers exactly as I but that, and that's the point right so. If you are a brewer or you're thinking of starting a brewery, don't look at the ATO as your enemy because they are not your enemy, right? You've got to pay the tax. It's just a part of doing business. The ATO actually there, they treat you, they, they call themselves, they, there's a couple of people there that I know in the ATO call themselves customer service representatives. And they're there to help you comply with the rule, with the rulings and all that sort of stuff, mm. right? They're not there to catch you out or anything like that. And if you've done made a mistake, they'll they'll go, yep, honest mistake. All right, let's fix it up. Let's get you compliant. And that's all they want to do. They just want to make you compliant. Mm. Um, and you know, so if you're if you're starting a brewery and you're dealing with the ATO, don't treat them like they're your enemy because no. they will make your life very, very hard very, very quickly. You need to factor they, it into what you do. They want to help you, they want to help you comply. And that's your job, is you've got to comply. So let them help you. Know? Mm. And 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 you'll find that if you take that approach with the ATO, life gets a lot easier. 
and you'll yeah. wind up in that situation. I don't know how often your excise returns are done, but you'll go from weekly to monthly to quarterly excise returns pretty quickly. Yeah, there's there's different. There's also different deals for 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 depending on your size and what deal you're on for what product you pay excise on, not just the interval. Mm. Um, but in terms of how you manage the cash flow, like like it's not you know there's there are options with the ATO. They do have payment plans and things, but th then you run into problems where like if you're on a payment plan with the RTO, it's really hard to go to a bank and say loan me some money for equipment because the last thing they want is to deal with a company that has a debt to the federal the government. Yeah, because so, the federal government will get paid first. Exactly. Um, so it, it does get quite complicated. And then you've got things like the, the annual excise refund, which is, you, you, you know, you would think ideally you'd build it in to the way you price things, but just in practice, it's not really how it works. It's like when that comes around, you get the injection back from that money, it just yes. helps because you kind of fucking need yes. it. Yeah, so you basically, um, so for those who are not aware of that, so um, every brewery gets $350,000 a year uh, as a refund and excise. It's now 100%. It used to be 30000 then it went to 100000 Now it's $350,000 to equalize it with wine and that sort of thing. Um, but <laughs> in order to get the $350,000 back, you have to pay them $350,000 got to physically give them the cash then yeah. you've got to fill out the form and then they send you the cash back you've got to be there's no up. there's no yeah. there's no filling out a fucking table like on your baz where it's like you paid this much gst you collected this much gst here's what we owe you here's what you owe us it's like no they want their cash and then they give you the cash back hmm. crazy it's a way it's a way to make sure they get paid it, it's it's useful it is fucking useful because it's really sure. challenging cash flow business um bloody yeah all right anyway that's excise in a nutshell chris would also how far in advance do breweries typically plan their brews not at all weeks months for the year um i, I can give an answer to that so can i give an answer to that it really depends like that like, depends if they're dry hopped or oh, the dry hopping is a challenge um but if you, if you got i think if you've got a small brewery you can be real loosey-goosey around this sort of shit with with yes. us, it's really quite challenging and it puts people out a lot if you try to rush beers through. And like we've got five, five brew houses across three locations, a big core range of beers and a weekly release basically of a, of a, a, a limited release beer. Mm. Um, so if you want to rush something through, like, like we're doing a flood relief beer at the moment and this is one that we're rushing through. We're like, we, we want to brew it within... You know, two or three weeks of the floods happening and in order for that to happen I kind of have to do a lot of the stuff myself I have to tell people like this is going to put people out we have to get mm. our designers to prioritize this beer ahead mm. of other beers you know yep. we have to um, put find a tank for it there's, there's a there's a fucking lot of shit that goes in and in a company at our size it's a lot of people that you mess around to change up a general natural flow of things yes. like like we have probably probably about two months, I suppose, if you could pick a good amount of time frame to get it all done. Mm. Um, so the bad. big bi-monthly limited releases, we, we want to be about four or five months ahead, ideally. Yep. Um, but if we want to rush one through, we can rush one through. We can brew a beer tomorrow, but it just fucks everyone over. Yeah. So that's, um, that's kind of how it works for us. It's an interesting one. Like, you know, um, I think the bigger you get, the more planned you have to be. Yeah. Right, because the thing is, is that you can't just if you run a brewery, you can't just wake up on a Tuesday morning and go on brewing pale ale. Just doesn't work that way. Um, the the business has to lead the production plan. Sales team has to lead the production plan. The sales team has to put in sales forecasts. The, the production can't has to aspire to produce a certain amount of different types of beer. And the only place that, that can come from is the sales department, right? And so you've got to plan your business. So um, I would probably say in your business, there would be a year's worth of planning in advance. You'd have a sales plan and plan in advance of different SKUs and all that sort of thing. And the production plan would, would work around that. You have, uh, when you're planning production, you usually have your uh, strategic, like long-term planning, 12 months in advance. Mm -hmm. 
That's so you can go out and go and do hop contracts and exactly. mop contracts yeah. and all that sort of stuff. And then you got to have your tactical stuff. So usually um, you base short-term decisions based on a five-week stock forecast. What you don't want to do if you're running a brewery is you don't want to brew too much beer and package too much beer so that you have too much stock in the warehouse because that beer may not sell that quick and it might go old mm -hmm. um, or it ties up cash flow, ties up cash, yep. when, you know, because you've got to pay the excise and you've got to pay the raw materials. Yeah. Uh, and then you've got to sell it. Then you've got to wait to get paid. Um, and so it's a very, it's a bit of a tightrope. And you, and you don't and you don't want to run out of beer like it's, it's yeah exactly it's, so is, you don't want to overproduce and you don't want to run out of beer yeah this is like we i would say and it's hard because it's a very challenging business and there's lots and lots of challenges and problems but i would say the scheduling in of all of that stuff which is basically eddie's job at black ops is and then not just the scheduling in of the ingredients and the planning of the beers but the all the way down to the ordering of the ingredients, the rostering of the staff, the schedule, the brew schedule, the pack schedule. I would say all of that stuff is far and away the most difficult thing that we do. That that's the mm. most that's, yeah. that's the thing that presents the most amount of challenges every single day, I would say. I don't envy Eddie on that at all. Yeah, and I and I say Eddie, but it's it's a it's a fucking big team of a lot of really good people. Mm. But it, it is like a daily thing, it's like the way the schedule matches in with the ordering and the, the things moving around and things getting distributed. Like it's a business yeah. of moving things around. Oh, yeah. It's the goods in as well as the goods out. Like you don't want to have too much finished goods sitting in the warehouse. You don't want to have too much raw material sitting in the warehouse. Everything's just in time. Yeah. Because if you have lots of stuff sitting, either raw material sitting in stock or finished goods sitting in stock, it's all cash, right? And so, um, because it's a very cash intensive business, the way that it works, if you think about the cash cycle in a brewery, um, is you have cash sitting in your bank account, which then turns into raw materials, which then turns into um, finished goods sitting in the warehouse, which then turns into an invoice waiting to get paid, which then turns back into cash back in your bank account. Yeah, over right. a very long period of time. And over a very long period of time. The faster you can get the cash to go around that cycle, the, the more healthier a brewing business will be. Well, yes, but you have to offset that against the fact that the more volume you do, the more efficient the business is and, and the more economies be, yeah. of scale you have. Right. And, and the more volume you do, the more sales you do into places like Woolies and Coles and the, the, that cycle time increases. It's like a fucking... Yes. Yeah, yeah that's right. But the, the same principle applies. The faster you can get that cycle to go around and around, um, the better off your brewing business will be. Right, but, but what I'm saying is the, the nature of, like if you're trying to scale a business, the nature is that that's going to slow down the more and more you scale it because you go from brewing a keg of beer and selling 100% of it at your mm. tap room and getting paid mm -hmm. up front to yes. you know months of of invoicing yes. and, and all of that so it's yeah. yeah it's super super challenging changes changes the game it's hard work don't envy you all right darren hosey with all the crazy beer oh wait sorry uh chris wood had one more question which he's right. well and truly entitled to because is he on his 12th question this is the 12th question what is oh, yeah. the most overrated style of beer out there oh fuck that's an excellent question most overrated style of beer out there. You mean overhyped or, or overrated is, is I think the style is overrated? Mm. Personal opinion? Ah, oh, fuck it. Yeah. If I was going to talk about an overrated style of beer, and this is just my personal preference. Yeah. Um, uh, for me... Um, sour beers for the sake of being sour. Okay, like overly sour beers. No, just sour beers for the sake of being sour. Like, like, like when you want to think about beers that are overrated, where beer geeks out there just gravitate and get the hype up about a beer because it is sour. Okay, and nothing else. Right. Not whether it's a good sour, not particularly around the style of sour it might be. You know, it might be a Belgian. Goza, Goza might be, you know, something else. 
yeah. um, but just going, oh, it's sour. Oh my God, this is amazing. You know? Meh. Not, not meh, but it's like, I don't know, yeah, there's, you know, it's just, there's just so much more to life than just sour. You know? Okay. There's so many different styles of beer out there. And that would be probably the answer to that question. Right. My answer is Grzitzki. Grzitzki? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I'm fucking sending. Face. I'm sending. <laughs> I'm sending Michael a fucking message to say send me a Grodzitsky recipe. I had an idea actually. Okay. About that. Um. So I'm shooting a series of YouTube videos at the moment. Um. About how to build a yeast propagator, um, for commercial size yeast propagator. All right. And I need some yeast, and so I might reach out to some friends down in Melbourne, and and get them to propagate some Grodzitsky yeast. And okay. then we can use the yeast to make a Grodzitsky. It sounds good. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. And it can be the most overrated beer. Grodzitsky. Yeah, fucking yeah. Make, make Grodzitsky overrated again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good question. Two more questions. Oh, wait. No, actually, that last one is for me. So this is the last question. Darren Hosey, with all the crazy beer flavors, how about a curry? beef pie flavored beer could do a baker's dozen series and do custard tart jam donut apple pie flavors etc hashtag shit post custard tart apple pie well, that's, a, that's already been done okay that's not a shit post that's that's life <laughs> uh beef curry curry beef pie when I, mean, I did pepper steak quarter you did. We're doing a hot cross bun beer, so that kind of ticks That's off the bacon. That's a fucking great doesn't. idea. Um, great idea. Um, I don't know. I, I think as soon as you bring um, very assertive flavours into the beer recipe process, like Thai curry, beef curry, all that sort of stuff, there's just not that umami backbone that goes into a meat dish in beer. You know what I mean? No, I definitely don't. I don't know what that word means. I know it means something. Umami? Yeah. Don't know what umami means. It's like fishy or something, right? So basically there's four, well, there's actually supposed to be more than four, but the four fundamental flavours are salty, sweet, sour, and bitter, spicy. That was more than four already. That was Yeah, right. So maybe it's six. Fuck it. And... um, and umami is one of those. So umami is that savoury flavour. So if you ever have, um, you know, bruschetta, like toast with tomato and love that mozzarella shit. and salt, I fucking love that shit too. That's yeah. umami. If you have, um, the Japanese always put umami in their food. It's just, it's like, you know, if you have, you ever had that bonito on Japanese food, which is like the shaved like fish? Fish flakes, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right? good. It's the shaved fish flakes. It makes now have you ever actually had Benito, just eaten a taste of Benito by itself? Can't taste shit. Mm. Can't taste anything. But when you put it with other foods, it just lights them up. It's phenomenal yeah. stuff, right? And so but I'm more confused than ever. Is it is it taste like bread or is it fishy? No, no, it's not bread, it's not fishy, it's savory. Okay. Right. So, um, and it revolves around, okay, so you know MSG, right? You kind of, yeah. MSG. I knew in MSG, the 90s it was really bad for you. It's not bad for you. Okay. Um, and so they put that in like a lot of Chinese food because that enhances the savoury flavour. Okay. And it's a glutamate. And that's what, that's what umami is, it's glutamates. Glutamates. Okay, and, and this is relevant to the beef curry pie? Well, I'm just saying that it's very difficult to put umami flavour into beer. Right. It's not really the right carrier for uh, umami flavour. It's not to say that hasn't been done because Garage Project have done Umami Monster. Okay. Um, and so they have done that. Uh, I never actually got to try that beer, but um, yeah. He's probably well, more just one. thinking just the curry kind of flavour, wouldn't he? Well, you can have the spice and the chilli yeah. and all that sort of stuff. But if you're going to do, say, a Thai curry, Thai curries are always spicy, sweet, and salty at the same time. Yep. Right? And it's a balance. 
and that's a it's a tough balance to do in a beer. Well, on that note, I just remember that I've got leftover Thai curry in my fridge, and I'm fucking hungry, and I'm going to eat it right now. So, well, go and get some umami into you. I will. Let's call it there, Hendo. Love your work, man. You too, mate. And it's your job today to send me the recording. So I'm going to send you the recording. Doesn't work, it's, yeah. it's on you. <laughs> it's on me. <laughs> All right, mate. Have Catch a good you week. next week, man. See you, mate. See ya.